So uh, I think it's about time to get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Nick. I'm the director of projects with AI at UCF. And today we have Michael DuPont. He's a software developer for Disney. Uh, Michael, go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Uh, yes, my name is Michael DuPont. I am a senior software developer for Disney. I work on the emerging technologies team which uh, I like to tell people we work with all kinds of tech buzzwords except for uh, the blockchain. So AI, you know, AI, machine learning, computer vision, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, computer vision, chatbots like we're going to talk about today. Great, that's awesome. Um, so if we're ready, we can, uh, Michael, you can go ahead and take the stage. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen because I, well, what I would like to do with you guys today is to actually build a chatbot from scratch. Uh, I, oh, I didn't, I didn't mention the intro. I, I am the organizer of the Orlando Python meetup. Uh, I've given uh, tons of talks there and, and helped the group uh, stay around and be relevant during the pandemic here. Oh, you need to uh, enable screen sharing, by the way. Oh, give me a sec. Um... And anyone who's in those groups uh, can can tell you that uh, I love doing live coding. And I know, I know that's the bane of a lot of people's existence sometimes, especially if you say go to a conference. Uh, but, uh, and that I also really love tangents. So if you have any questions at any point in time, ask them right then and there. <laughs> uh, and we'll answer it, go down a rabbit hole, and we'll come back. Awesome. And uh, just so everyone's aware, feel free to unmute yourself at any time. If you have a question, just go ahead and shout it. No shame. It's not, it's not like lecture here. This is a place where we can hang out and talk to each other. Okay. So we're in dialogue flow here. And we'll go ahead, well, we go to create a new agent. A little bit of, a little bit of background on dialogue flow, actually. It used to be called API.ai. It, it itself was a startup and was bought by Google about three years ago, three, four years ago, uh, rebranded it. Uh, and it's you know, the reason why they bought it is it was the easiest way to create uh, Google Assistant skills, and in my opinion, still is. Now, uh, we're creating this new uh, this new agent. What would you guys like this agent to be about? General companionship, maybe, like not really task oriented, perhaps. Okay, so uh, just having having a friend in the pandemic. Yeah, that would be cool. Relevant. What, what should the friend be named? Maybe. Uh... Uh, let's just, uh, let's call this my companion because sure. you know if if you're if you were to go out and actually make this public, uh, one of those things you might want to do is allow the user to select a name for the uh, to for their agent to be say hey can you change your name to name and we'll, we'll that we can actually have that be one of the first things that we do here so we don't need to worry about the rest of this for this particular project oh did, did it cancel oh maybe i have too many just a second Actually, I'm already in this in this uh, DF demo here. Yes, yes, yes. Let me delete this. I think I think it only allows you to have a certain number of agents uh, without paying. So I created. I'm creating one of my uh, say my virtual companion. His name is Jimbo. So that's my name of choice. Great. Hmm. 
Oh, I'm sorry. interesting. I'm, personally, I'm having trouble getting to the uh, dialogue flow uh, page. I keep hitting the um, projects in Google Cloud. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. so the uh, this URL here, dialogueflow.cloud.google.com. As long as you're logged in uh, to your Google account, uh, if it sends you off to just the, I think it's just dialogueflow.com, there should be a sign in button there to get started. There we go. I'm there. What? I'm trying to stack overflows for you. Yeah, that's really weird. Hmm. I wonder if I can just repurpose one of these. Yeah, you could just create a new intent that we could uh, Start from yeah, scratch, maybe. this is fine. Uh, I think I this is probably something I haven't touched in a while. Uh, I, I do. I've done some work with Code for Orlando, so I think we, this was one of these uh, example things that we were working on a while back. Anyway, so we created a new agent. Yeah. Uh, the first thing we need to do is you know let's pretend that these don't exist for the time being. Uh, whenever a new agent is created, we're automatically given two intents. We get this default welcome intent, which if we click into, it's listening for the app has been opened and we'll respond to with this uh, text response here. How can Orlando help you today? And you, uh, you can put multiple responses in here and it will just choose one at random. So if I just go to up here in our window, we can do open app or hi, any of these. Oh, wait a second. I just do hi. Oh, never mind. Uh, what you were seeing down here is the other one is it doesn't actually know how to respond with hi or open app because we're actually already in the app in this testing framework here. This default fallback intent, as the name might suggest, is if your agent is given some kind of input that it doesn't know how to handle, it will come down here to our default fallback intent. And we actually don't have any uh, responses in here yet. So I can go ahead and uh, I'm not sure how to help with that. Save this. Hey, Michael, uh, we have a question from the chat. So um, they're wondering what an intent is. Um, I kind of explained it. It's, it's almost like a function. Um, yes. If you want to go ahead. Yeah. So uh, sorry, I kind of skipped over that. So an intent is analogous to a function in your application. So this, this agent is itself an application, and an intent would be a function. Uh, however, the agent is determining how your function gets called uh, based on what intent the user uh, what what intent matches closest to what the user said. So we can uh, we can get a better idea of exactly how that works if we create this new intent here. We're going to call this change name and what sort of things would you as a user say to this bot to say, I would like to change your name to blank, or I would like to change your name. You could say, um, you know, can you go by, you know, the name Michael or? Can I call you Michael? Did you go by Michael? Can I, can I call you? Michael. So this is our training data. These are these training phrases here are saying, if I in here say, 
uh, can I call you Michael? And I can just do that right here. Can I call you Michael? It's recognizing it. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, oh, we haven't saved this yet. That's why. Always important to save. <laughs> if, we, if we do this again, Nope. I, this is what I get for not starting with something clean here. I'm just going to, I'm going to clean these up. Yeah. Um, I think what's happening is the program is recognizing it as a command that um, isn't the one that we're trying to build right now. So getting you're, rid of those. You're correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is, this is called a, a conflict. And this, uh, even though we, I wasn't clicking into those other intents, this is very likely that the number of phrases that those other intents were trained on were so vastly outnumbering, can I call you this? Even though it was an exact match, it likely had a stronger confidence that it was that other intent than it was this one. It's kind of like when you try asking Google to like set a timer for your pizza and before you know it, it's like calling up your ex-girlfriend. <laughs> okay, so we, we now are hitting the correct intent here. Can I call you Michael? We don't have a response yet, uh, but it did, it did identify our change name intent. Uh, no, obviously the first thing we might wanna do is a text response saying, sure, you can call me Michael. However, uh, well, and if we save this and we so we have our intent has been saved. We should now get a little notification saying the agent has trained. And if we run this again, sure, you can call me Michael. Now this is great if you want your bot to be named Michael and only to listen for Michael. If we ask it for, hey, can you call me Sarah? It's still gonna say, yes, you can call me Michael. So now, what we want to do is we want to listen for any arbitrary name. And we do this by having slots. Uh, and a, sl a slot is analogous to a parameter in our function. So one thing, uh, I, there are two ways you can do this. You can either uh, set it down here explicitly, or we can actually highlight the word or phrase that we want to say this is a parameter. And they already have a bunch of these system entities built in that we can choose from. So if I just do name, we have sys.given name. And then I can also highlight this other phrase down here. And it already, it knows which entities this intent has already been assigned to. So now we have given name, yes. But now, we want to say, hey, sure, you can call me whatever name you just said. Well, this value here, this dollar sign given name, which is our parameter name here, all we need to do is use our parameter name, given name, save this. I call you Lucera, and I'm going to wait for the agent to be finished training. There we go. Can I call you Sarah? Sure, you can call me Sarah. Cool. What about like a last name? Can it also handle that? Yeah. So we can have, uh, can I call you Michael DuPont? It's my name. Uh, so it, it already recognized that Michael is a give is part of our given name slot here and we can do the same thing we did before where we highlight that other one and we can do last name and now we have two here if we go ahead and yeah so that's now part of our training data so it can now listen for obviously can i call you sarah or uh, I Smith as the last name. Sure, you can call me Sarah. Or we can come down here, and I'm actually not sure. And call me 
given name, last name. I'm not. Sh I'm actually not sure. Yeah. If it knows to choose one or the other, given given the uh, the slots that were filled. There you go. Okay. It seems it seems to be smart enough. Otherwise, that would have come back 50-50. Now let's say that we want to actually make this required. What if we, uh, can anyone tell me what might happen if instead we say, uh, can I call you something different and have that be in there? Uh, so can I call you something different just Can I call you something different? Well, we didn't slow. Uh, so yeah, it actually is doing something uh, something good here. Where if this if the slots are not filled, it's not going to use any of these text responses down here that require a slot to be filled in order to use it. So we actually didn't get a, a response back there. Now either we can say we can add a response down here saying you didn't give me anything, or what is likely what we actually want is if we at least make the given name a required entity, we can define a prompt here saying, uh, sure, uh, what should my name be? Uh, or specifically, this is asking for first name, so first name be. Close that. So now we have a prompt in there. If we save this, and wait for the agent to be trained and ask the same question. It's now actually going to say, sure, what can my first name be? So that, uh, and then if we actually want to use this here, uh, we're, we actually have enough in here where we can start playing around with it in the simulator a little bit. Uh, so, here, uh, we can also go in and we can define custom entities, which we can do later if you guys, uh, if you want. Uh, so uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that then. We'll, get, uh, we'll also get to fulfillment in not too long, but let's look at the integrations we have. This is where we can take our agent that we have built in Dialogflow and, uh, and actually put it on different platforms, obviously. They really want you to use Google Assistant. It's up top and it's big. And we'll do that in just a second. But to look at some of the other things we can do with Dialogflow. Telephony. These are all giant uh, uh, call center companies. Uh, Disney actually uses Avaya. And uh, uh, so we can actually integrate this as the front to a call center. But you can also just use this Dialogflow phone gateway and they will give you a number where you can just call your bot. And I've done this for, uh, for hackathons for some pretty cool demos. That's cool. Uh, you got Twilio here for text uh, for, uh, for uh, other, other uses there. We got text based. So you can just have a standalone web demo. Uh, you can create a uh, messenger bot, line telegram, Slack. Uh, this, as you can see, this, this was a Slack bot at one point. And then there's other things here uh, like Twilio text messaging. And up until about a year ago, you could even export this over to Alexa. I can't imagine why they removed it. <laughs> so, so we're going to do, uh, oh, there, it sounds like there's a question. Oh, yes. Uh, silly question, but is there any way to uh, export it in a different way that could be used with other things? Like, say, uh, Instagram isn't listed on there among the things. Is there a way we could export it in a way we can make it compatible later, like with not listed there, platforms. There is a way where you can get the, the data out of here. Uh, there, there are two main ways. So if we go into our settings, you can actually import and export. This will export your entire project as a, a series of folders with JSON files in them. Uh, and then you can, always, you can use this for backup as well. So restore and import as well. Uh, there's also a an SDK available for Dialogflow. Uh, I've used the Python client uh, and you have complete access 
to your Dialogflow project in a programmatic fashion. Uh, that's your entities, your intents, uh, basic configuration. For, for Disney, we had one project where we needed to have a series of entities that were constantly kept up to date based on uh, based on what what uh, attractions there are in the park, for example. And rather than saying, hey, a new attraction has been added, let me go in and manually change things. Uh, I created a, a script that would pull the entire attraction list down from the internal Disney APIs, same things that are powering the, the mobile apps and, and the website. It would parse, parse all that information, pull down the existing synonyms from Dialogflow, package it into, uh, into these JSON files, and then upload the entire thing back up to Dialogflow. And then I actually automated that, so I never had to worry about that, you know, keeping my entities up to date ever again. Fantastic, awesome. Nice. Okay, so uh, for testing, uh, we can do this in Google Assistant, and all we need to do is, this is our Assistant integration tab here. All we need to do is just go to test for the time being. This is deploying the current state of our model to the Google Assistant. So uh, we have a question from the chat and he's asking how um, in, the, in the sentence, can I call you something else? How does it know that the word something isn't a real name? Oh, so this is where we're actually leveraging the, the built-in system entities. Uh, we, can, we can actually uh, take a, a look at this by, uh, rather than going to, to test things first here, let's create a new intent. So we, we have this companion agent uh, and let's say that we want uh, we want it to tell us a story. So let's just say, uh, or uh, give me some, uh, no, actually, well, what would you guys like to do? Uh, can you uh, first, can you define what an entity is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's just say that, uh, uh, you guys have worked with things like enums before or, or dictionaries that, uh, the, the, with uh, key values. Okay. Yeah. So, it, it, we, uh, so if we have this companion bot here, and uh, let's say that we want it to tell us a story, just as an example. So we have, uh, we have an entity called story and uh, so, so this, uh, this story can have a bunch of values in it. Uh, uh, let's just say Moby Dick for one, although I can't imagine why you'd want a bot to read you the entirety of Moby Dick. Uh, or... 1984. 19, uh, I've got 1984. One more. The Hobbit. Hobbit. Great. So we are. Uh, so we have a an entity here, which is of type story, that has values in it of Moby Dick, 1984, and The Hobbit. If we want to use this entity, we can create a new intent called. Uh, read a story uh, read me 1984 no. put that in there it has already recognized that it is of type story oh. and we can now do something uh, well save this it will, it will update our model, and we can now say, uh, "Can you read me 
Moby Dick. We don't have a response in here yet, but it you can see that. Oh, wait, oh. So, no, that's changed name. Oh, so actually, he, this is a good example here. This is, this is that uh, uh, the collision issue that we saw earlier. So the can you part, because we, has, because we have so many training phrases in, in change name that start with can, it actually has, uh, it has uh, anytime it sees can now, it, it's going to give a higher uh, possibility score to change name than it is to read a story. And we can fix this by saying, uh, by adding, uh, can you read me a story? And there's no book in here. We can make this a, per, a required parameter just like we did before. Uh, story, would you like? Or can you read me Hobbit? Again, it knows that it's a story. We can save this. And now if we run the same thing again, instead of saying change name, it should say that this is read a story, which it is. Cool. Yeah, I was probably picking up on the first name, last name, nature of Moby Dick for, uh, for the other intent too. Like they probably thought it was a name, not a story. It, it is possible. Yeah. It, it may have thought the story was a name. However, uh, I would be high, I highly doubt that story itself is a name in the given name or last name entity that the model is trained on. It probably just overfit with can with the other intent. Mm -hmm. I believe if uh, I, we can't actually go back now and see it, but when it had first name, given name uh, in there, it was probably asking, hey, what, uh, what name would you like me to call you? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. It's really cool how you only need so few training phrases to get started. Like you don't need a, you know, to scrape Reddit to say have something halfway functional. You just put in ten sentences and it it's able to generalize fairly well. Yep. There, uh, I know that on on the dialog flow side, they're doing a lot of uh, training phrase augmentation in order to make that work, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, even with all of these different uh, NL, uh, they're called uh, NLU, a natural language understanding, as opposed to natural language processing, they are doing a lot of NL NLP under the hood to to un try to suss the meaning of what you're saying rather than just looking at the exact sentence structure. Uh, but obviously, the more training data you have, the better it's going to be. Interesting. So you said augmenting, would that be like changing the grammar of a given sentence or adding in a different, you know, like add a, add different punctuation or articles or several mm -hmm. different words? Yeah, cool. it, it's going to make uh, it, for, for lack of a better uh, phrase, uh, crowdsourced uh, ways to say a sentence just based on probably all, you know, all of the different searches that get put into, into Google. Yeah, yeah, because they have so much data and they know how to boil it down to like, it's true meaning. That's why Google search works so well. They can really pick out like what question you're asking for, even if you ask it in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, and, and just, just kind of to hammer, hammer that home, uh, we only have three training phrases here. Can you read me? story. Can you read me a story? Read me story. Uh, but I bet we can do, can you read my kids a book? I bet you. No, okay. Uh, then I, I went a little too far off the training phrases there, but you know, so it hit our default fallback intent here. All right. It's, it's usually pretty good about uh, being able to pick up uh, not qu what you said is not quite what I am trained on, but I'm still fairly confident. Uh, and, and you can actually go in and adjust how aggressive 
your default fallback intent is just based on uh, the default fallback intent is going to trigger if none of the intents are above a certain confidence threshold, like say 30% yeah. or 60%. Uh, and that's all that that's tunable in all of these different NOE platforms. Cool, cool. Okay. So we're halfway through. I'm, I'm going to uh, jump back over here to our uh, our test just to just uh, just to give one example of having that conversation flow or you could say the dialogue flow of asking for the name because we we specified that you at least need to give it a first name as a required uh, a required slot uh, so can I change your name I'm not sure how to help with that. Oh. Oh, did we? Uh, uh, oh, that's right. That's that's uh, could. But can I call you something else? Yeah, that's right. So all of these different things, if I was doing this in production, I would go, can I change your name? I'm not sure how to help with that. Oh, I'm going to put that in there <laughs> as a new training phrase. Yeah, yeah. And you guys. Uh, when you start playing around with this, you'll see how it works. Where um, you'll be able to like see like kind of what it's able to do. Oh, there we go. Here we go. So we we got this back. It's now expecting me to say, uh, let's say Jim. Okay, you can call me Jim Els. <laughs> okay, I'm not actually sure That's... where this came from, <laughs> but some. Oh. Uh, can I call you something else? Oh. So it it apparently it heard well maybe someone's last name is else, <laughs> and and it didn't and something here this is actually a very uh, let's say a timely example where it definitely did not interpret something as a first name. Yeah, yeah, but it picked up on else somehow. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, and here's the other cool thing. Um, once these, once your agent is in this interface here, our, our actions console, and you can test it, it is now whitelisted on any other Google device or on your Android phone, or if you're on iOS, the Google Assistant app. So that's great for, for product testing. Yeah, I have a home mini and I just play around with it all the time. I'll be typing on my screen and then I'll just trigger it with my voice right away. Uh, and we actually, uh, for uh, in, in the office, we, well, we're not really in the office anymore, but anyway, uh, we really love having the devices with screens on them because they do the live transcription as you're asking it. So it takes out one possible did it really hear me correctly? And if it didn't, you can just you say, okay, it didn't hear me correctly. Let me try something different. Cool, cool. Okay, so we, ha we have a basic app. We can ask it to change its name, even though it's not really changing its name, uh, and have it read a story. Uh, at this point, I have 25 minutes left. We can jump into the back end by adding a fulfillment layer. This is uh, uh, everything that we've done so far, as you've seen, we haven't written any code. Everything is living on Google servers. But there are times when Google is not going to be enough and you want to have some more uh, pulling information out as opposed to just responding with whatever is in the entities. To do that, there, there are two things we need to do to start. So we have, uh, we need to enable a webhook, which I'm actually going to clear that out. Uh, and let, let's say, let's have our, our change name stay the same, but in our read a story, we didn't give read a story a response. So there's this other tab down here called fulfillment. And we can selectively enable or disable calls to our fulfillment layer uh, on an, uh, for each individual intent. 
don't uh, remember to save when you whenever you change anything in here. But now uh, we can just ignore dialog flow here for a little bit. Now I uh, I, I sent uh, a or I created a gist uh, with the code for uh, for you guys to use. And I have it just right here. I'll go ahead and open this. In it's posted code. in the Discord. I'll, I'll post it again in the chat just for anyone who wants to follow along. Okay. And I have, I have some instruction in here on how to run this. Um, I'm in my conda library and all of that. Uh, so this is using a library called Fast API. Uh, there's, 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 uh, you don't have to use a specific framework here. In fact, uh, the, uh, if you're, if you've, you can do this with Flask or with uh, Starlet by itself, Django, doesn't matter. It's, it's all web. Uh, I do like fast API for, for new APIs because they do a couple of nice things. A, it's async compatible in Python. Uh, so we actually have async def down here, which is great. And they also leverage a, a uh, another library called Pydantic to uh, do parameter and payload body uh, validation. So our code down here is not going to be called unless uh, the, the data that our user, or in this case, Dialogflow is giving us is valid. So it adds, it, uh, that adds a level of protection. So well, you can see down here. Uh, actually, before I talk about this code, let's pull dialog flow back up. Now that this here is enabled for our webhook and we saved it, if I try to do uh, readme1984, it's actually going to give us some diagnostic info and we're, uh, we're going to have to wait for this to time out. But we have this diagnostic info down here. And this, uh, this raw API response here. Oh, no, a second. Uh, I think I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, let's actually just get this running. So in order to make this publicly available, we're using a lovely little command line utility called ngrok. All this does is make my computer appear as though it's on the public internet. And all I need to do to do that is I'm going to go to my desktop. I have my little ngrok executable here. It's free, by the way, uh, HTTP, and we're going to mirror port 8080. So now we, uh, we have these forwarding URLs here. So any web server that I have on my computer that is uh, per, uh, listening on port 8080 is going to be available on the public internet through ngrok. I can copy this as HTTPS. Uh, dialog flow only allows HTTPS uh, fulfillment endpoints, by the way. Go ahead and save that. You can also add authentication, header values, all that good stuff for, uh, for securing it. Now. So if I use ngrok like every day. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to hit me up afterwards and I'll be happy to help you with them. But it's a really powerful tool that's really simple to get set up. I use it for showing a friend a website I'm working on without having to like configure DNS. And it's just very easy to get started and it's great for this project. It's, it's another one of those great hackathon tools as well. Totally. Because you can have everything and, uh, the reason why we're using it here is, you know, if you're in production, you're going to deploy this into AWS or Azure, GCP, or your enterprise cloud. If you're if you're in uh, if you're doing it for work, but it's much harder to debug on those than it is to just see the print statements come down here. Uh, okay, so uh, we're also using uh, a program called Uvicorn. It's uh, it's one of these whiskey apps spelled W S G I. Uh, that rather than using fast API or if you've used Flask uh, or any of these other things, they, they have debugging development servers. This is what you would actually use in production. 
and Fast API actually prefers that you use Uvicorn. But all we're doing here is saying, Uvicorn, we want you to run on port 8080, which is what Ngrok is listening to. And the, app, the application is in our app, uh, in our uh, app file, app.py, and it is named app. So that's, that's all that the syntax is doing here. But now, uh, we, now we have all of this set up. If we do uh, readme1984, we should have gotten, yeah, so we got, uh, we received a post request here, which we're, lis uh, we're listening for a post at our root. Uh, we got an unprocessable, un uh, unprocessable entity, however, so we're going to debug this a little bit. And we, here's where this diagnostic info should be able to come in. So basically what's happening is Google is sending us a whole lot of information and we haven't really processed it at all, right? I'm wondering, uh, just because this is, an, this is an old agent, I bet this is actually sitting on the the v1 apis that are going to be deprecated soon and i built this for the v2 however it's not it's not that big of an issue all we need to do is change how we are validating the input and it should work just fine okay. uh, so all uh, if we're looking at this this is the uh this is what's being sent over uh and actually I can do one other quick debug thing. I'm going to, uh, I think I have Flask sitting in here as well. If I just create a new file, let's call it app two. I'm just going to have this be a really basic Flask app. Has anyone, yeah. Has anyone worked with Flask before? Anyone? I think a lot of uh, people interested in this project, they're, um, a lot of them are like freshmen or sophomores, so they might not be super familiar, but um, a lot of the libraries we're using today are pretty common. So. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask in our Discord, and I'm sure someone can help you like get a Flask app running or help you debug your code. But Flask is um, it's like a web server application or web server library uh, where you can handle different requests to um, a web server and return whatever information that a user is looking for. Sorry, uh, sorry for blowing through this so quickly, but I uh, I want to make sure we have enough time to to actually make a response for you guys. I think that uh, this should be all we need just to see what's coming in. So I'm going to stop this. Uh, I'm going to actually got one more. I'm going to do app dot run port 8080, and then I'm just going to run this directly. So Python app2.py, and that should, oh, great. Last just wants to know what it should be called. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so without changing anything else, if I do uh, readme 1984 again, um, let's see. Here, here's the input that we are getting directly from Dialogflow. I just output this as a as a JSON file for us to for us to view. So yes, th uh, this is exactly <laughs> my, uh, my suspicions. So we're looking at a uh, version one. This is not going to be the same as what you guys are using. Just I I, I repurposed an older uh, app. 
but actually I bet there, you know, there should be a way if I go in here to our settings. Oh, yeah, so legacy V1, if I upgrade this to V2, save, I bet that actually is all I need to do here. So I'll run Uvicorn again and we shouldn't have any issue. Okay, I'm responding to read a story intent with one slots found 1984. That's perfect. Uh, cool. Yeah, so if we go back up here, uh, all this is doing is trying to validate and parse our fulfillment request here. So we're going through and saying, well, here's the query result. The things that we want in order to figure out how to respond to this, we need to know our parameters. So here's our story type and the value that it was looking for. And also we want to know the intent. Now that their name property here is whatever they're internally looking at, their ID, but we care about the display name. So that's that's where we're getting. If we look in here, a query result, you know, just kind of ignore the syntax for the time being, but we have our request here, which has, here's our parameters, which is a dictionary. And in our in the intent, we want our display name. Now, if you're if you're doing this and you're creating your own API, you have full control over here, but this is just responding to the data that we are being fed from Dialogflow, which we don't have any control over how they uh, how they create the uh, what's being sent to us in the request. The nice thing here is we now have these regular Python classes that we can just pull the data from almost as though we were just referencing a, a, like a JavaScript style syntax. So we can create this, uh, the response here, which this should work for any, uh, our, uh, albeit V2 uh, dialog flow app saying I'm responding to our intent display name with however many parameters there are. And then we're just, uh, we're joining all of the parameter values. Uh, so if we, if we made our first name one uh, require external fulfillment, then we'd have two parameters in here and the values would be first, uh, likely first name, last name, because I believe they come in the same order as they are listed in our slots here. Now, if we if we want to use this, let's see. We got we got ten minutes left. Uh, do you, do you actually want to do a question time after the entire talk is done? Yeah, that's uh, fine. Um, yeah, if you guys don't mind, this might run over a few minutes, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I can I can show just one example of actually using the display name uh, to to handle different intents. I think that okay. would be very useful. Yeah, yeah, go for that. That's that is really useful. Okay. So you'll notice that <clears throat> we only have a single endpoint here and it's a post because we're receiving data. If we if we go ahead and we set fulfillment for this intent as well. Uh, so intent saved training has started, all that good stuff. Uh, can I call you Steve McQueen because that's just the Disney name that came to me first. I'm responding to your change name intent with two slots found, Steve and McQueen. It's really cool. <clears throat> uh, so it was able to recognize that, okay, this is a different intent and here are the different parameters. Uh, we're, and uh, if we want to actually respond in a contextual way to these different things, we can create different handlers. So let's just say this, this is, a, we're gonna handle our name and we're going to take in, uh, let's, let's actually make this, uh, let's just say, we're going to take in just the parameters. So let's just go ahead and we're just going to print the uh, parameters for now. 
if I try to make these keyword arguments, uh, because uh, actually, let's let's do that right here. So if I go ahead and instead of using these, uh, if I change these to underscores, I think Python will be much happier. And uh, story shouldn't need it. So I can actually change this to uh, given name, which is a type string, and a last name, which is, should also be of type string. And we're going to return a string. This is these are just uh, Python. Uh, uh, function annotations. Python is not strongly typed. It's completely optional, but in my opinion, it enhances readability, even if you don't want to use the optional type uh, type uh, checking libraries. Yeah, I noticed that in some of your videos that uh, you use that kind of, you define all your types, and I've never seen anyone code Python like that. It's really interesting. You're finding that uh, type annotations are becoming far more prevalent in uh, in maintained libraries, modern libraries, because a lot of people are using these type uh, annotation checking tools. And you'll actually see Pydantic, uh, where it's actually checking the types against the types that we give it. So if display name was none, it came in with a null value. It actually will say that it wasn't validated because in, in Python, if you want to do that, is actually uh, you give it an optional wrapper. Hmm. And still in Python, uh, if it's not a basic type, we have to import from the typing library as you see up here. Okay, interesting. Uh, the, the other nice thing with something like Fast API with these typings is Fast API will automatically build your, your API documentation for you, interactive documentation. And it uses these types here to specify, you know, to, to actually build that documentation on your behalf. Wow, that, that's super convenient. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so one last thing. Oh, uh, okay. we have our, our given name and our last name here, and then we just need to add an F to the front, and now this is a formatted string. And then the other thing we have here is we're going to handle our story as well. And that one is just a story that is also a string, and we're going to return a string. We, so we now have these different handle functions here. Uh, the easiest way to get this mapping done is going to be to just create a dictionary here uh, to say if we are given this change name intent, so change name, which is our display name, which we're pulling out right here. Uh, the handler is going to be the handle name, and if we get the uh, read a story, we're going to handle the story. So rather, than, you know, we don't care about the count anymore and we honestly don't care about anything else there. We can do, uh, we can have a check here. Uh, let's just say the handler that we want to use is uh, our handlers dot get our intent. And uh, in, in Python, the, if you uh, get on a dictionary, if it doesn't find the key value in there, it returns none. So that's a nice little check for us. Uh, and I think I'm actually, uh, I'm on Python 3.8, so I can actually do this. Oh gosh. Uh, if handler our walrus sign. Oh my gosh. That's the first time I've seen that used. It's, it's not, it, there are a handful of times where it's very useful. I, in my opinion, this is one of them. Right. So we can actually, uh, so we can say text equals our handler, and we're going to star our uh, say query result dot parameters. So this is just taking the dictionary that is parameters and uh, saying the string value is explicitly this given name. So I so. This is actually the uh, an example where the parameters on the front end, which is Dialogflow, 
are actually going to match. They have to match what we're expecting in this function, given this syntax, totally optional. Mm. Uh, but I think it looks, it makes it look really nice. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, we can have an else here. We can say text equals, uh, I'm not sure how to help with that. And we turn that. Okay. I, we're going to rerun this because Uvicorn, uh, I didn't give it the, the, uh, the command line argument to reload. Uh, so this is now up to date. We don't have any code errors in here. And if we go back to uh, uh, can I call you Steve Jobs? Okay, I'll go by Steve. Okay, we change name. I'm going to just get rid of these text responses here. So really what you're doing is you're offloading the functionality from Dialogflow to your Python application? Correct. Okay, yeah, so we, really did, we did get a post here. Perfect. So this, uh, I, I erased the responses here. So there's, there's absolutely nothing coming from the front end. This is being done entirely by the back end. So, okay, I'll go by first name, last name, or uh, read me the Hobbit. Read me the Hobbit. Let's start reading the Hobbit, which is exactly what we did here. Awesome. Well, there's as as your application gets bigger and more complex on the back end. Obviously, you'll want to uh, this kind of thing would be put into a separate file. Maybe all of these live in separate files. That that sort of thing. Uh, but this this is the I'd say this is, the, this is your basic template for how to handle all of the different intents that require going to the back end. Now, there's n nothing that we did here actually requires using the back end, but uh, we, could e we could very easily replace this handle story with, uh, let me, uh, given this story, let me go check some external, uh, let me check Audible, uh, the Audible API to get a, an, the, a link to an MP3 and then tell Google Assistant to start playing this MP3 instead. That, that, that would be a very good use case for having a backend for this particular intent. Yeah, you can really code in whatever you want and interface with different APIs or you know, other programs that you built so that you can operate them using these voice assistants. Yeah. And the, the other recommendation I will give you guys when you're, uh, when you're doing your projects, let Dialogflow do as much heavy lifting as it can. And one example of that, that I mentioned earlier is if you can use a system intent, use a system, or uh, not a system intent, if you can use a system entity, use a system entity rather than having to go and manage your own list of things your custom entities should be things that don't exist in the system. There are tons of system intents. Uh, so oh, maybe it's maybe because we just don't have any added yet. Uh, let me just create a new intent. I want to call this uh, airport because I love I love this example. Uh, so let's just say where is uh, Orlando International. So it should know that Orlando International, or uh, we can have this be an airport. So this is just one of those many system intents. Now, if I look up in the dialog flow documentation, oh, dialog flow uh, system airport, system entities reference, and then I'm going to search for airport on here, system airport. You'll see that this system airport, if it matches the name 
or, or even any of the codes like uh, MCO would be uh, MCO or KMCO would also match for Orlando. Uh, if, if I enable this to have fulfillment on the back end, I'll go ahead and save that. Uh, I'm actually going to print what our query parameters are here just to show you what information we get from it. It's not going to match anything. So if I, so when I, when I test it, we're going to get this. Uh, I'm not sure how to help with that phrase. Oh, and I need to also reload this. This should be trained now. Uh, and I can use a different airport name. So uh, where is JFK uh, in New York? I'm not sure how to help with that. Great. But we should have a print down here. It doesn't even, it doesn't look like we. Do you know what? I don't think you saved the intent. Oh, you, you might be right there. Oh yeah, because I got the default fallback intent. That is correct. Okay, training completed, good catch. You're going to be hitting that blue button a lot when you're in dialogue flow. Yep. This is also why pair programming is great. Okay, so we got the correct intent here. I'm not sure how to help with that. We check back here. So it was able to recognize the system entity, but look at all of this other information we get. It knows the country, the city, the name of the airport, and then the airport codes. Uh, so Absolutely. If uh, this is all information that we don't need to know, I can uh, I can and uh, I can repurpose this saying, uh, "Where is Miami International?" And it also uh, you can see the value right here. Uh, it also knew that uh, I can specify it by the airport code or the airport name. It's uh, these are very flexible in that way. And uh, one other thing you can do with these entities that I didn't mention earlier, but will also be very useful. So we have the Hobbit here. These are the values. The, uh, but over here, we can add synonyms. So there's the Hobbit, uh, or we can call this uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings <laughs> prequel. <laughs> Uh, and if we go ahead and save this, or uh, let's just, we can say this, uh, the bleak book, doesn't matter what you call uh, the bleak. This... The book we were all forced to read in high school. Yeah, I much preferred Brave New World. Yeah. Uh, so it's we can just... have, uh, read me the bleak book. And well, hey, oh, it didn't finish training, that's why. There we go. Yeah, let's start reading 1984. That's awesome. So I, I, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have for you guys. We're only six minutes over time. And uh, any, give me any questions you have. I'll be, I'll be on as long as people have questions. Are there any questions? Um, Michael, I have a question for you. So, um, have you played around with the knowledge thing right there um, on the sidebar? Have you played around with that? I haven't, in okay. fact. Okay. Uh, Just wondering. We, we would you like to show it off a little bit? I, I have uh, I have not played around with it uh, uh, myself. Yeah, maybe I'll play around with it after this and let you know if I come up with anything. Um, does anyone have any questions about um, software development or working for Disney or creating these kinds of chatbots in a work environment? I guess not. <laughs> well, uh, Michael, do you have any questions for us? Or any comments, closing remarks? 
Um, I'm usually so bad at this. Uh, at that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So dial, uh, dialog flow is very powerful. Again, let it do as much work as as you can. There's uh, there's tons of other things in here I didn't even get into. For example, you have uh, you can add follow up intents. So mm -hmm. if you have an intent that requires a yes or no answer, you can explicitly just add a follow intent that says, uh, "Hey, can I? Would you like me to get your car?" If they say yes, well then. Uh, what should I do when they say yes? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can you can also branch this out into uh, well, what if they say no, or what if there is something else? Uh, yeah, you can nest all of these intents together and string together yep. something a lot more complex. And yeah. So even you know this nested one, we can add a follow up to this one, and this is how you build your your conversation tree. Every, uh, anything here is going is at your high level but when you uh, when you get into these nested ones they're only available within the scope that you specify which is very powerful uh, the, the other thing that i think will be very useful if we go back to our integrations tab here there's these implicit invocations now this is uh, you can add any of your custom intents here so you can have uh, if we add read a story to it and we go to test, it's now updating our, our action, our, our Google skill here. And uh, I didn't change the invocation name, so it's still you know, talk to City of Orlando, but if, uh, if I do uh, talk to City of Orlando, which is just what we have here as our uh, open my app, uh, we're now just opening up, uh, this is hitting that welcome intent that, that it gets pre-populated for you. But if I want to jump immediately into an action, I can do uh, ask uh, city of Orlando, which is so weird, uh, to read, uh, to read uh, 1984. Hopefully this should work. Got it. Getting the test version of city Let's start of reading 1984. Let's start reading 1984. So you can have ask my companion to start reading my uh, my Twitter feed as an example. And then that actually is a great example of having an implicit intent because you're going straight into what you want your bot to do to a specific intent. That's then sending a request over to your backend to pull from the Twitter API to get say the most recent five messages uh, from from any given feed. And maybe the particular feed or, or list you want to pull from is a parameter, is the slot. Uh, and then it constructs the string, sends it back to you. That's a great example. Yeah. That's a, yeah, these things are very highly useful and uh, so many possibilities for what you can build with them. Uh, we have a question from the chat and he's just asking, are there any other examples that you would recommend we check out? Um, any other things that you've seen that are worth looking at? Um, for well, for dialogue flow specifically, or for the NLU uh, chatbot space in general? Uh, he asked for dialogue flow specifically, but you can elaborate on other uh, okay. chatbot well, programs. I, I have two specific examples for dialogue flow that I think, uh, if you get to the point where you're happy with what it's saying, you have this screen here that you could potentially use or having things display on your phone. Uh, dialogue flow allows you in your intents to, uh, to have sp uh, specific things on a platform level. So you can see that uh, if this is our default response here, which will actually be filled by our, by our webhook. Uh, but if it's being called from Google response, we can add a response here to do basic things. Uh, I'll actually just create uh, a new intent here just to show this. I'm just going to call it test and it's just going to listen for test. So it's highly overfit <laughs> for this specific use case. Uh, but I'm going to uh, add an assistant custom response and this is just a basic card and I can give it, uh, this is a title
cool. It's re uh, required text. Uh, this is a basic mobile card. And then we can give it, we can give a URL uh, for, for an image mm -hmm. accessibility text. We can have this link out. I'll, I'll have this uh, link out to uh, one of my websites, actually. Well, so you're, you're creating like a package response with like more than just text. Yep. If I go ahead and say, if I save this, oh, I think it's missing. Oh, it needs something. It needs something in the default tab. Now, if we're if we're calling this on Google Assistant, we're never going to see the default, or we shouldn't see the default ever. I don't think. And if I come back in here, I'll just, uh, I will reset my interaction here. Got it. And do Let's get the test first. Test. You can see we have a basic card here. We're now leveraging the display. Mm. Uh, That's awesome. And it, it, did, it, said, it said test back. So the, that default response there was just what it said. You can have it display one thing and say another. Uh, a great example of this is uh, if you were, if you wanted to, if someone was asking for the, the public library operating hours, you may just say the library is open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. But on the card, on your display, you may actually give the operating hours for each day of the week, uh, you know, su uh, Sunday through Saturday. And that's, that's more information. It said exactly what the user wanted, but then the screen gives you the, op uh, the opportunity to provide more context around your answer. However, you should never, your, your response should almost, or, uh, the response that gets spoken should almost never have as much information as is displayed on the screen. Because if, you're, if, if it's talking too long, it gets very annoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've experienced that. Yeah, it, it's really a user experience that you're trying to engineer into making something have a conversational element to it, something that, you know, people want to talk to and people that are able to uh, retrieve useful information from or interact with in a meaningful way. If I get rid of this here, uh, we can look at uh, another response. Uh, this may be another, another useful one. You can have media content in here. So this is just displaying a large image or an icon. Their uh, suggestion chips are those little bubbles that appear as uh, suggested answers or suggested actions, either on the bottom of your assistant screen or on the, the devices. Carousels are you know, it, the swipeable images, multiple images on the screen. Uh, and then you can, you can even just do custom payloads in here. Uh, the Google Assistant functionality to have media playback like audio or video files. You can have a custom payload that sends your users directly to a YouTube video on your display. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, these uh, chatbots are more than just chatbots. They're interactive media and you can create really whatever you want out of them. Yep. Well, um, it looks like we're 15 minutes over. Michael, we really enjoyed having you. Thanks for coming out and sharing all this very useful information uh, with us. Um, once again, uh, I'll post a link for your club, Orlando Python, and let us know if you have any uh, meetings in the near future, and we'll, um, you know, we'll send some love your way as well. Okay. Uh, good yeah. luck on your projects, guys. Yeah. Yeah, we'll keep in touch. Great. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out to this meeting. I enjoyed spending time with you and learning more about these awesome chatbots. Alrighty. Uh, signing off. See you guys. Peace.